Hello students, this is Mr. Carter, and this lesson is on relating volume to temperature in gases, which we will soon discover to be Charles's Law. To begin, let's think about a hot air balloon. I'm sure most of you have seen a hot air balloon at some point in your lives, but you may not know exactly how it works. In order to get a hot air balloon to fly, there has to be a flame underneath it. Whenever you heat the balloon, the gas volume inside tends to increase. Likewise, whenever you cool the balloon, the gas volume tends to decrease. You can represent this with any regular balloon that you would buy from the store. If you take a regular balloon and blow it up and then tie a knot around it and then stick it in your refrigerator or freezer, you'll see soon enough that the gases inside of it will deflate because you've cooled them. In the mid-1700s, French inventor, scientist, mathematician, and balloonist Jacques Charles was the one who discovered this relationship between volume and temperature. He actually discovered this while working with hot air balloons. Now, before we take a look at Charles's law, let's see if we can mathematically derive it on our own. So what do we know about the law so far? Well, we know that gases expand when they're heated, and that they contract when they're cooled. So if we look at that from a mathematical standpoint, we can assume that the relationship between volume and temperature is probably inversely proportional in some way, shape, or form. We also know that the pressure must remain constant in this type of system. If you allow pressure to take a effect in this type of system, then that plays a completely different role role and allows for different variables to take place. So before we continue, try and pause this video and see if you can come up with the law on your own. So after we analyze those relationships and those facts, we finally conclude Charles's law, which is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. You can also read this as the initial volume divided by the initial temperature is equal to the final volume over the final temperature. So, now that we know the law, there are a few things to keep in mind while working with Charles's law. First, we always measure volume in either liters or milliliters, depending upon the situation that you're given. Sometimes the question may give you an initial volume in liters and ask that your answer be in milliliters or vice versa. So, in order to satisfy these requirements, the relationship between liters and milliliters is that one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. So knowing that, you can convert liters to milliliters or milliliters to liters, whichever is necessary. Another thing to keep in mind is that we always measure temperature in Kelvin. If you're ever given a temperature in degrees Celsius, all you have to do is add 273 to that degree Celsius number. So for example, if you're given a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, for example, your degrees Kelvin would be 373 degrees Kelvin. So, now that we know about Charles's law and how to work with it, let's work a problem. Okay, let's take a look at this problem. It says a 600 milliliter sample of nitrogen is heated from 27 degrees Celsius to 77 degrees Celsius. What is the final volume? So the first step is to write down your equation 
and to convert your temperatures from degrees Celsius to degrees Kelvin. So if you add 273 to 27, you get 300 degrees Kelvin. If you add 273 to 77, then you get 350 degrees Kelvin. Your next step is to plug in the known values into your equation. So you put the 600 milliliter as your V1, the 300 degrees Kelvin as your T1, and the 350 degrees Kelvin as your T2. Your third step is to rearrange the equation with all of your known values on the same side and your unknown values on their same side. So when you rearrange this equation, you would multiply the 600 milliliters times the 350 degrees Kelvin and then divide that value by 300. And when you do that math, your V2 is equal to 700 milliliters, 